the first talk was a little bit about the hardware and a little tour of what the hardware was in there, but the hardware by itself is not much use because you need to be able to program it. And to do that, you need a programming environment. And you need to be able to build software to run on this system. So in this next talk, we're going to give you a run through of some of the things that are there. So we're not going to teach you how to use all of these different things. And some of the things may not be relevant to you, or they may not be relevant to you now. But similarly, they may be relevant to you, but you just didn't know about them. So it's a sort of view of what's there and, in general, how you access things, different parts of the software libraries on this Cray system. So Louis DeRose, who's the sort of head of the, the programming environment team, the people that do the, the libraries, the compilers, and whatever, and Cray R&D has this phrase that he always uses, that a good programming environment should narrow the gap between the peak performance and the achievable performance. You'll never get peak performance, but you'd like to get a reasonable proportion of that and without doing too much work. Yes, you could sit down and write assembler code for everything. Yes, you'd probably get the best performance of anything that you could do, but you don't really want to do that. Either you don't know how to do it, you don't want to do it, or um, you're worried that if you do do it, in two years' time, they'll buy a new CPU and you have to rewrite everything. So a programming environment is a higher level way. This is a way to sort of um, give you improved scalability of your codes, give you good performance, but reduce the complexity. So, the programming so when you log in, you get this uh, programming environment that provides you with um, Good application, the highest levels of application performance, it sounds like marketing speak. It gives you good performance. If you do nothing else, if you use the system out of the box to compile your code, you should get pretty good performance. Because the system is automatically making sure you're compiling and you're getting the, the best performance out of the particular CPU that's in the system. It's making sure that you get a good selection of network optimizations automatically, it's making sure you get a good level of optimization automatically. So if you do nothing else, and there are some people who never optimize their codes, they just compile them and run them. And for those people, they will get pretty good performance doing nothing else. That's not to say you, won't, you can't do better, but um, you can get pretty good performance without doing anything at all. So the programming environment provides you with quite a lot of tools and libraries. It provides you with a consistent interface to different compilers and libraries, so that if you want to switch from one to the other, it's much easier to do that. Um, and of course, we, we pack it as well as Cray software. There's software from other, other um, third-party developers, so debuggers, tools, these sorts of things, libraries, and we package these up in a consistent way with what we're doing. But of course, if there's something that you need and would like to see, please ask. You know, there may be that the, it's available, we just haven't s supplied it because didn't think anyone wanted it. It may be that something can be done to package it up. Certainly, if it doesn't work, we want to know because we can work out why it's not working. So in the middle, you've got the Cray Linux environment. This is the Linux um, distribution that is running is a pretty standard one. It's a bit cut down when it runs on the compute nodes. And then around it, you've got all the different tools. So we supply four different compilers on the system. There's the Cray compiler, there's the Intel compiler, there's GNU, and there's PGI. And then there's debugging tools. Um, it's a linear DDT and total uh, Rogue Wave Total View. There's performance tools, there's CrayPat and CrayReveal, there's power tools, there's IO and libraries um, to do with um, dense linear algebra, sparse linear algebra, all the sort of typical range of libraries you'd expect to find, PETC, LIMP, uh, BLAS, all these sorts of things. Workload management, well, Slurm is what's um, used here at CSCS. And then there's um, third-party applications that we won't really talk very much about there, but there are a range of them. 
So what sort of things do you find? Well, there's programming languages. There's compilers there for Fortran, C, and C++ for all of these different compiler suites. There's also support for Python. So in terms of programming models, um, you can use MPI or Shemem to do your communication between processes. You can do Shared Memory OpenMP 3.0. Well, it's actually 3.1. Um, the Cray compiler that's coming out next month has quite a lot of OpenMP 4 supported. OpenACC, which is a GPU, a way of programming GPUs. Um, it's got full support for version 2. Then if you want to take um, other ways of programming across a system, there's Coarray Fortran is supported, um, which is another sort of message passing. It's similar to Shemem and MPI in many ways, but it's actually part of the Fortran language. UPC is a sort of threading model which um, some people use. Chapel is a, a whole new programming and, um, language, which is very much data parallel in that you don't write about passing messages from here to here or threading this or threading that. You write up your code in a new language in a very data parallel way. And the, the system, the runtime, the compiler maps this efficiently onto the underlying hardware, which could be a crazy supercomputer, it could be your laptop. Um, and so you don't worry about the best way to decompose your problem. But of course, the disadvantage of that is that you rewrite in a whole new language. So for some people, that's something they're willing to do. For other people, it's not. In terms of compilers, um, I've mentioned the compilers that we support. In terms of tools, you've got debuggers. You've got both the sort of traditional debugging tools that you might use. You know, there's GDB, there's an LGDB, which is a parallel version that Cray, that Cray packages. And then there's the graphical debuggers like TotalView and Alinea. There's other tools that are there. There's something called ATP, Abnormal Termination Processing. And what this means is that if your code crashes, as it crashes, you get a view of the stack trace of the program that's saved. So you can see what was the program doing at the moment it crashed. So it'll tell you that three of the ranks were in this routine and five of the ranks were in this routine and another rank was in that routine. And it's a good way of seeing what was going on because quite often what you see is that 2047 ranks were doing this and that's kind of what you'd expect. But one of the ranks had gone off and done that. And this is a way to try and work out why it was crashing. And stat is related to that. If you have a process hang, you can connect to that process and get the same view. You can see where are they why is, you know, what are they doing and why is one of them hanging? Performance analysis, there's various performance analysis tools. You'll hear later in this course about CrayPat, uh, which is a way of tracing or sampling how an application runs on the system to get performance information. And then Cray Apprentice 2 is a, a graphical way of viewing that information. And then there's scoping analysis, there's a tool called Reveal. Reveal is a sort of browser for your source code. You can look at your source code. You can look at what the compiler is doing to your source code. You can also pull in performance information and see which, route, you know, which loop nest is taking a particular amount of time in the profile. And if you decide you want to use OpenMP to thread your code to make it more efficient, it can even do that for you. It can generate the OpenMP directives, doing all the analysis to know whether variables should be shared or private, all these sort of little headaches you have. If you have an OpenMP code and it's giving you the wrong answers because you've said something was shared and it should have been private or something like that, you can actually ask it to check the OpenMP for you and say which ones it thinks might be wrong. Lots of libraries are provided. So there's LAPAC, ScalaPack, Blas libraries. Um, the Iterative Refinement Toolkit is a way of um, Changing precision to get to the answer quicker when you've got some sort of iterative process. You've got FFTs. There's a Cray adaptive FFT called Craft. There's FFTW. There's PETC. There's Trillinos. Most of the libraries that you might use in your code. And then for I.O., there's NetCDF. There's HDF5 um, if you use those. So for MPI and Shemem, 
the Cray MPI is based on the MPITCH um, implementation from Argonne National Laboratory in the US. It's a very standard um, MPI distribution. There's many tweaks that go on under the hood. So the way you use it at the top level, you use the MPI calls just like you would. But there's tweaks in the underlying inside the library that make best use of the Cray hardware. So for many of the collective operations, you know, where you gather data or you send data to many processes all at once, there's improved algorithms that make best use of the, the hardware. There's an asynchronous progress engine, which is, we'll talk a bit about that this afternoon. That's when you want to try and overlap, do some compu computation while the communication is happening. Um, there's some buffering that's do done with MPIIO to try and get um, smooth out the access to the file system to give you better overall bandwidth. Um, and there's very good one-sided messages if you're using um, that sort of thing. It, there's full MPI2 support, um, except for some very dynamic things that people don't generally do on an HPC system. There's more or less full support of MPI3. There's one or two things that aren't yet supported. Now, MPI, as we'll say this afternoon, is a sort of two-sided process. In MPI, you typically say, I am going to send this data, and somebody else says, I am going to receive this data, and there's basically a handshaking that goes on between them to make sure that this all happens. There's other ways of doing things, which is much more one-sided, where you basically say, send this data over there, and over there doesn't have to do anything. That other node, the data just arrives. Or a node can say, get this data from a different node, but the other node doesn't have to do anything for that to happen. And there's different ways of doing that, these so-called PGAS languages. Shemem is one way of doing it. Cray Shemem is a very optimized, very, has a long history. Um, there is a, an, op an open standard for Shemem called Open Shemem, and Cray Shemem is fully compliant with that but goes quite a bit beyond. There's a lot of extensions beyond that. So for FFTs, there's Craft and FFTW. Um, and the way they use, they're programmed is that you can use them in an interchangeable way. So you, it's very easy to try one or the other in your code. You know, because sometimes trying a different library, one happens to be better optimized for the particular case that you're doing in your code. Um, for dense linear algebra, there's all the usual things. There's BLAS, LAPAC, Iterative Refinement Toolkit. For sparse linear algebra, there's Petsy, there's Trillinos, there's also CASC, which is a Cray, Cray library. Cray has worked quite hard. I mean, all of these libraries, when, when they're written, the developers think about which problem sizes do we imagine people are going to do and they put in specific optimizations for that problem size. That's why you shouldn't rewrite stuff yourself. You should use the libraries, because the libraries have optimizations in them. So it's much better to use the libraries if they're there. But sometimes, if you're doing a very strange thing, you know, if you're doing a square matrix, it's likely that there's a very good optimization in BLAS for it. But if you're doing a, rec a very long, thin matrix, and it's very, very thin, for instance, you may get poor performance. Don't treat that as a reason I shouldn't use the library because the library is rubbish. What that means is that the library should be optimized. You know, inside the library, there's lots of little um, if statements to say, you know, if the range of matrix sizes is this, then do it this way. If the range of matrix sizes is that, do it the other way. If there's a particular matrix size that you're using that doesn't have a well-optimized way to do it, don't say it's rubbish. Put in a help ticket, and the help ticket will come through to Cray. And you know, if it's a Cray library, we can work on putting an optimization in for that. So you know, this is, you know, we, it does require some feedback to do that, but we can provide the feedback. So people sometimes say, "Oh, the libraries don't work for my problem size." Well, you must, if you tell us what your problem size is, the developers of the libraries often have no idea what people are doing in their applications. They're always looking for application feedback. If you're going to get good performance, then you need information. If you're going to tune your code, what should you tune? You know, it's all very well saying, I can speed up the computation. But if the computation isn't the thing that takes all the time in your code, you're not going to see the benefits of that. Because what you should have been doing is optimizing the communications. 
So what you need is you need something that will give you performance analysis. And it's no good having something that just gives you performance analysis of one aspect of the system. What you want is an integrated view of what the whole, how is the whole application running? How much, you know, break down the time, please, by computation, by network transfers, by I.O., so that you can really see what the balance is and work out what needs optimizing. So you want an integrated view of how the whole application runs. And that's what these performance suites do. And Craypat is the one produced by Cray. But you know, there's other, you can't, there are other profiling um, tools available for these systems. And they all, I mean, they all have features that they do something that another one doesn't do, but the sort of core features of them all is very common. So they help you identify important, I mean, there's so much information available. There's so many hardware counters. The idea is to try and simplify this and distill down to a few things that you should try or you should concentrate on. And that's what Craypat helps to do. As well as reporting the data, it tries to make sense of it and give you some general pointers as to what it thinks you should work on. So if, if MPI takes less than 10% of the profile, it won't tell you to, it'll probably say, you know, I could do some optimizations of the MPI and suggest a better way to lay out the MPI code on the processors. But there's no point because it's not taking enough time. And again, your profiler should be scalable because you should be able to, there's no point, if you're gonna profile a code, don't run a small problem on your laptop. Profile it and say, all the time is in this. Because your laptop is completely different to a big system. And running a small problem is going to give you a completely different profile to running the full scale problem on the whole system. Yes, you want to, you may not always be running on the whole system, but when you're doing your initial profiling, you should profile on as big a run as you can. So your profiling tool must be scalable to that size of system. So in terms of debuggers, um, I think there's going to be a presentation from Alinea on the DDT debugger as part of this course. So the other tools that I've talked about is the STAT and the ATP, which is a way of finding out where, what were all the ranks doing when things crashed. And if you're running with 200,000 ranks, um, if it tells you, if it gives you a list of what every rank was doing, that's not very useful. So what it does is it consolidates this, it distills it down into groups. So it will tell you that all but three of these ranks were doing this. One rank was doing this, one rank was doing that, another rank was doing this. And then it gives you a graphical view of this, a simple block diagram of where everything is and the whole backtrace, but, but compressed down to that sort of single page picture. And that's very useful for identifying particular things that are different. STAT and ATP are very similar like that. ATP is when it's actually crashed, and STAT is a way of um, getting in because it's hung. Fast track debugging, if you have an application that crashes after six hours, and they do sometimes, running to debug it, you have to compile it with less optimization. That in itself is a problem. Maybe it then doesn't trigger a crash. But also, if you turn off optimization, it may t want to run for 24 hours or more before it hits the problem. The fast track debugging is a way of compiling the application twice, once with all the optimizations, once with the debugging. And then basically you run, you put in, you say, run the optimized one for the first five hours and 59 minutes, and then switch over at this point to the one with the, the debugging on, just to catch what's going wrong at that point. So that's a fairly new thing that um, Cray has been supporting, only been supporting it since December. And then there's the MPP machine like no other. I didn't write this slide, I'm afraid. Um, they're all different, all systems are different. So, the Cray XC30, you've got a high-end CPU, you've got a very good interconnect, one of the best interconnects. I mean, it wrote, you know, it's won awards, HPC Wire awards. It's a, the Ares interconnect, um, even compared to you know, the previous Cray interconnect with Gemini, has been a massive leap forward. 
We've no longer got a torus. You know, if you try and run on a big Gemini system, you will notice the fact that you're on a torus because it will take longer to communicate between ranks that are on nodes that are quite distant with many hops between them because it is just a torus wiring. This, all, this layered all-to-all -all network makes a huge difference for that. The global bandwidth, the bisection bandwidth when you go across the system is um, much, much better. So, so far we've seen a little bit about what the node looks like. You've had a brief overview there of what sort of software is available, but how do you actually get the software? How do you use the different compilers? <coughs> so that when you log on, everything is set up using the GNU modules framework. This isn't a Cray specific thing, it's something from GNU. Modules are a way of packaging up software so that it's very easy to switch between packages or between versions and then changing the path to where the compiler is. You know, if you've got two versions of the Intel compiler, they'll be in different directories on the system. So when you type i or whatever you, to compile your code, you need the path to be set up right to pick up the right version of that. So if you want to use a different one, you've either got to type the path explicitly or you've got to change the path environment variable to take account of that. Modules is a way of doing that automatically. So all of the software that you see on the Cray system is all packaged up into these modules. So it means that there's lots of different packages available and you can have multiple versions of the package if you want to try different versions. So that might be because you just want to try the old version because the old version was faster. If it is, tell us. It might be because you've got an old application and that relies on using a particular version of the compiler. And there are applications, you know, with GCC which will only compile with a particular version of GCC. So then you want to be able to make sure that you use exactly that version. So all these modules have a name, which is the name of the module, and then they may have, if there's different versions of them, it'll be module slash and then a version, which might just be a number or it might be a whole string of different numbers. So when you log on, you get the default versions, and the default versions have been chosen by the system administrators, and from time to time, they will put new versions on and change the defaults. So that's what you get. And if you just say, give me the Intel compiler, you will get the default version, unless you tell it to use a specific version. And if you do want to use different versions, then there's a command called module that you can use that changes all of this. If you're familiar with this command, the more of this I'm telling you is just, there's nothing new here. If you want, you can, as a user, if you switch between stuff a lot of your own, your own code, you can write modules for that and do that. Or there can be, you know, CSCS has written some of its own modules to take care of things that are specific to CSCS. So when you log in, you get some modules. Every time you log in, you'll get the default ones. If you want to change things, you do it by swapping modules, loading new modules, unloading modules, or swapping versions of modules. And to learn all about the command, there's a man page. And we're going to talk about compiler wrappers in a minute, but the modules affect those. And you get a standard default set of modules, and that's when you log in. So what you need to be careful of is if you log out, or if the system logs you out because you've been idle and you come back, you'll have gone back and you, you'll be back with the default modules. And particularly if you're programming the GPU, the Cray PE Axel NVIDIA 35 module that you need will not be loaded again. So you'll start compiling all your OpenACC and it won't be using the GPU at all. And you'll, work, you'll be scratching your head why. It's because the module hasn't been loaded by default. Because for good reasons, but you can find out which modules are there by typing module lists. So if you do that on Daint, this is what you see. So you see a big list of modules. So there's quite a lot there. So there's 26 modules. They're in no particular order. But um, so number one is the modules module um, that provides all the module stuff. Quite a lot of them here are quite low level. They're not things that you would typically play around with. So there's things to do with um, the networking. There's things to do with being able to run AP run. The ones in green that I've shown there, 
These are optimization modules, and they should be loaded, and you should always check that they're loaded. What they may mean is that when you compile your code, you will be making best use of the Sandy Bridge processor. So you won't have to put in all these arch flags to tell it that I'm going to be running on Sandy Bridge. All of those flags are put on automatically to the compilers, but just by having this crepey Sandy Bridge module loaded. Similarly, all the low-level stuff that's specific to the Ares network as opposed to the Gemini network, that's all put in by the crepey network Ares module. I can think of no reason when you wouldn't want those loaded. So don't unload them. There, are, there really isn't a reason. Which ones might you change? Well, the ones you might change are the programming environment. So here, I'm going to talk about programming environment in a sec. We've got the Cray programming environment loaded. And as part of that, when you load that module, you also get the actual compiler module, which is CCE. And this is slash 8.2.4. So that's the version number. So you might want to change those. So in that first little job script, it actually changes from the Cray programming environment to the PGI programming environment in order to access the pgaccelinfo command. So there's other modules there. There's slurm, which is to do with, um, that's a CSCS specific module. That's to do with providing you with um, various information when you do the job submission. ATP is providing you this functionality to get the backtrace. Don't unload that one. If, you re if for some reason you really think this shouldn't be running, and the overhead of this is nothing. I mean, when we run benchmarks to sell systems and we're trying to get the most performance out of the system we possibly can to beat the competitors, we don't unload the ATP module or disable it. There really is no overhead to it being there. And when your job crashes, it's really useful. So don't take that one out. Um, the total view ones don't, none of, don't affect performance. You don't need to touch those. All of these low-level ones you shouldn't touch. Why are there two Alps modules loaded? I don't know. That's not standard. <laughs> if you type module avail, you will see a list of all the modules you could load. There are hundreds of them. Um, some of these are different versions of what are already what's loaded. Other them are non-default packages that are provided by Cray for other things. So when you're looking for something, you want to narrow down this list a bit. So if you type module avail and then a few characters at the start of the module name, if you type GC, it will give you all of the GCC modules that are there. If you want to do a more complicated search, then you probably want to grep the list. Now, a feature of the GNU modules is that when it writes the output, it writes it to standard error, not to standard out. So if you try and grep, it won't work, because grep works on standard out. So you have to use this little trick of mapping standard error to standard out with the two greater than ampersand one. This is assuming you're using bash. If you're using C shell, there's a similar trick. So I'm putting that there because you kind of, it's annoying. So there you can find every module that's got LU in its name, which is cluster tools and slurp. These aren't the ones that are loaded. These are the ones that are on the system that you might load. And if you do man module, there are various extra flags that you can add to module avail to narrow things down in other ways. So if there's a module that you want to load that isn't um, already loaded, for instance, if you want to do Cray profiling, before you build your code, you have to load the perf tools module. So module load perf tools will provide that and change some of the way the compiler works in order to make sure you can profile your code. If you want to load a specific version of perf tools, you do module avail perf tools, it tells you all the versions that are there, and you say, I want to load 6.1.0, then you can say module load perf tools 6.1.0. If you don't put the version on, you get the default. If you want to swap modules to a new version, if you've got Intel 12.6 loaded and you decide you want to try Intel 13.1, then you can do module swap Intel, Intel slash 13.1. So that the first one is the one that you've currently got loaded, and you're going to replace it with the second one on the list. So you don't have to give the version name if it's already loaded, because you should only have one Intel module that's loaded. 
so there's no, so you don't have to put it there. If you decide you're done profiling and you want to go back to compiling without the profiling, then you can unload a module. So you can do module unload perf tools. When you do this, it changes all sorts of things. It changes the path environment variable so that, you know, when you load a module, so that when you type um, FTN, you get different behavior. It changes the man path, so you get different man pages for different versions. It changes the LD library path environment variable, all sorts of things. Whenever you, you should always use modules and don't try and hard code paths in your make files, your build scripts, whatever. Just use modules instead because it's more flexible and it's more um, future proof. So we've talked about which ones are loaded, how to list the ones you've got, how to choose a new one, how to swap ones that are already loaded, how to unload them. There's two other commands, module help, and then a module name, or module show. One of them gives you the release notes. That is, when Cray packaged this module and sent it out, or when CSCS created, created this, there's some release notes, and they are made available through the module help command. The other thing you can do is module show, and that will tell you what this module does to your environment. So it will say conflict with this. So it means that you can't try and load this module and some other modules because they'll get in each other's way. It will also tell you about environment variables that are set or are changed by this module. This can be useful because if you want to detect if a module is loaded, if module show tells you this environment variable is set when the module is loaded, if you detect that environment variable, it's a good way of knowing the module's been loaded. So that's, again, that's just the module system. If you've seen the module system, you're familiar with this. When you're compiling, we provide a number of different compiler suites. The Cray compiler, the Intel compiler, GCC, um, and PGI. But the way you use those compilers, you don't type PG Fortran to compile with the PGI compiler. What you do is whichever language you're, pro whichever, you choose the language you're programming in, but whichever compiler you're going to use, you use the same command to, as the compiler. FTN for Fortran, little cc for C, big cc for C++. This is a wrapper. Depending on which compiler module you've got loaded, FTN might be the Cray Fortran compiler or the Intel Fortran compiler. So that's a convenience, but also, it also sets a load of flags. And those flags are things like architecture flags, optimization flags. These are being set for you. You can find out what they are, but there's lots of stuff there, which if you then go and run on a different system, if you have an account on Titan, the Oak Ridge XK7 system, You'll use the same compiler commands, but the optimization flags that are going in there will be for an AMD Interlagos processor and for a Gemini network. If you've hard-coded all this Aries stuff in there, you've got it wrong. If they upgrade the drivers for the network or the drivers for the GPU, and they're in a different directory, if you've hard-coded that in, you won't get the new versions. So you won't get the advantages, and your application may just break. So use these driver commands. And the way you do it is you use them just like you'd use the original compiler. So to compile an object file for Fortran, you'd say FTN minus C and the source file. So what FTN and CC and big CC translate to underneath will depend on a particular set of modules called the programming environment modules. The one that's loaded by default is ProgM Cray, but you can swap that to Intel, GNU, and PGI, and each one will give you a different suite of compilers. But in each case, FTN, CC, capital CC, are still the way you talk to each of those compilers. The real compilers are underneath. So they're Cray, FTN, Cray CC, Big Cray CC. So when you type FTN or CC, you can put some flags there, and there are some flags that will work for any compiler. But obviously, there's going to be other flags which are compiler-specific. 
And clearly, if you change compiler, you're going to need to change those. But you should do that as a separate step. Don't try to do, don't for that reason say, because the Cray compiler has a particular command for switching, for upping the level of vectorization in, when I compile, don't say, oh, because that's Cray compiler specific, I should just get rid of, not use the wrapper commands. Use them. If you try to submit a, a bug or a help ticket, my code isn't compiling properly, and you're not using the wrapper commands to start with, they're probably going to say you're doing something that's just non-standard and it's wrong. Progm of Cray is the one that's loaded by default, but you can swap them. Um, the Cray mpitch module gives you the MPI. If you're running a serial code, don't unload that. Just leave it there. It doesn't matter. But again, that's providing you don't have to give the path to the MPI library. You don't have to say minus L MPI in your link line. All of this is being provided by the module environment and by these wrapper commands. So as I said, there's usually multiple versions of each compiler. You usually get the most recent one by default. Um, the default, com so there's the progenv module. When you load the progenv module, it will also, so when you load progenv intel, it will also load for you the intel module, which is the actual compiler. So if you module swap from progenv cray to progenv intel, it will unload progenv cray, it will unload CCE, which is the actual cray compiler module, it will load up progenv intel, and it will load up the intel compiler module. Do not try to load multiple progenv modules at the same time. I think the system will stop you doing it. But do not try to find some clever way around it. It will break stuff. Do you honestly really want to use two compilers at the same time? And if the answer really is yes, and it, we believe you, there are ways around this. But almost nobody needs to do this. And it is going to be a world of pain, as my office mate always describes these things. But you can change compiler version. So if for CCE, if you decide instead of using the default 8.2. whatever it is, you want to use 8.1.9, you can change CCE versions like that. And you do that. You've got the progenv Cray module loaded, and then you just do a module swap on CCE. All the include paths, the link paths, the library paths, the, most of these are added by the modules, so you don't need to do these. You don't need extra MPI flags. These are added by the module, including in the wrappers. If your make file, for some reason, really wants you to set a minus load library path flag, minus L, just try minus L dot. Most of them don't, but there's some that just will not work unless you specify something. Just say dot for the local directory and let the include paths that's been set globally take care of it. If you really, 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 really do need to see the specific path, you really do want to give the path to a library, don't hard code it. Do module show the module for that library. There will almost certainly be an environment variable set, which is the path. Use that environment variable to specify the path in your build script. Then, if you upgrade to a later version of the library, or if they move the module to somewhere else, the, the environment variable will be updated and your job won't break. Um, right. Some of you may have OpenMP codes. Anyone? A few. You don't know. OpenMP is a way of threading. So typically a code is sometimes is written with MPI for nodes to communicate, for ranks to communicate, but sometimes you have threading as well with OpenMP. A crucial difference is that almost all compilers in the world do not recognize OpenMP by default. You have to tell the compiler, please recognize the OpenMP. The Cray compiler does it the other way. OpenMP is recognized by default. If you do not want OpenMP, you must switch it off. So these are the flags that you would use either to enable it for Intel, GNU, and PGI, or to disable it 
if you're using the Cray compiler. And those flags are obviously different for the different compilers. If you want to find out about the wrapper commands, FTN, CC, capital CC, there's man pages for those. But the, com the flags that you get for those wrapper commands are very generic things. Most of, if you're really going in and doing compiler optimization and compiler-specific things, you're going to want to find the options for a particular compiler. So to do that, you need to know the name of the actual compiler that's wrapped by FTN or CC or capital CC. And the names of these are on this slide. So the, the actual Cray C compiler is called Cray CC. The actual Cray Fortran compiler is called Cray FTN. The only reason you need to know these names is because if you ma do the, look at the man pages, you find all of the compiler-specific options. And these are the sorts of things you might want to know. These man pages will only be visible when the right programming environment is loaded. So if you do man ICC with the default progm Cray module loaded, you probably will say no such path, no such man page. So there's a lot of software on the Cray systems. Probably almost all of it is not relevant to any of you, but part of it will be relevant to somebody. You know, all of it, somebody will be using each part of this. So in order to simplify this, the module system is a way of integrating the management of this software. Don't try to fight the module system. It's not there to get in your way. It really does simplify things. The main one you're going to change is the programming environment module to go between different compiler suites. That is the main thing that you do and loading up the, the perf tools module for profiling. These are the main changes. And if you're doing GPU programming, there's another one which we'll see later called Cray PE Excel NVIDIA 35. There are wrapper commands. Use the wrapper commands. You can always change what the wrapper is doing with another flag, but do not avoid do not try to get round these. Again, they're not there to get in the way. They're not there to make your life hard. They do simplify things. And you're not locking your code into a particular architecture because usually you've got a configure. If you're running on multiple systems, you've probably got some sort of configure system anyway to, to, to set the compiler name for the different systems. So you just kind of integrate that into it. And they include a lot of default flags. You can find out what these flags are. Um, by doing the minus V or minus V. Just keep repeating the minus V flag and you'll get more and more information about the compilers. So, none of this is about particularly optimizing for the Cray XC30. None of this is about you know, making your job go fast. Most of it is about making your life easier. But you should be spending your time on making your code run well on the system and writing good code to do a new physical problem or whatever. You shouldn't be spending it trying to work out the path to the MPI library and why isn't your code linking properly. So that's why these sorts of things are provided. So are, are there any questions? <coughs>